So welcome to paper two for AS Physics for AQA from 2018. Now the combined mark from paper one and paper two is added together and that then gives you a score out of 140. So this paper is worth 70 marks and you add it to your score from paper one and that then gives you your grade boundary. So let's get started with question number one. So in the first question we had an air track with a glider at one end. This is released from rest, it starts to accelerate, it goes through the first light gate and then it goes through the second light gate and when it does that there's this interrupt card on top and that blocks out the light for a certain amount of time. So it tells us the time that the glider was in the first light gate and the time it was in the second light gate and also it records the time between light gate 1 and 2 and this uh, data is given to us in the table so that's the time it was in the first light gate that's the time it was in the second and then the time it took to go from 1 to the second was this time here and we need to work out the acceleration so this one here is a suvat equation so we're going to just write down s u v a and t and um what we know is that we can work out, if we know the time when it was at this point here, that means we can work out its initial velocity. We can also work out its final velocity at this point over here, and we can work out the time to go from here to here. So um, we don't know the distance. The initial velocity u, well, because um, the, the speed of an object or its velocity is equal to the displacement divided by the time, the displacement was 0 0.100 metres. Okay, so that's the amount of card that was blocking out the light for a certain amount of time. And initially the time was 0 0.50 seconds. So 0 0.1 divided by a half is going to be equal to 0 0.20 uh, metres per second. So our value for u is equal to 0 0.20 metres per second. We can do the same for the final velocity in the second light gate, where here that velocity is going to be equal to its displacement over time. Again, 0 0.100 divided by 0 0.40. Let me just uh, check that on the calculator. So 0 0.1 divided by 0 0.4 is, of course, uh, 0 0.25 metres per second. So we can see that it has got faster and therefore it's accelerating. And we're going to be assuming a constant acceleration even though this is the thing that we don't know. So that's what we've got to try and find out. And the time to get from here to here was given to us in the question as 1.19 seconds. So my approach to this to begin with is to write down SUVAT, identify what we don't know, what we need to find out, and then some of the values of data that we do know. Now, if we know U, V, A, and T, we can basically say then that the acceleration is equal to the change in velocity, so V minus U divided by T. Now we've already got the values here, so that's equal to 0 0.25, take away 0 0.20, divided by the time, which is 1.19. So 0 0.25, take away 0 0.2, divided by 1.19, gives an answer of 0 0.420168. Um, so I'm going to give this to two significant figures, like my raw data, and I'm going to give it in standard form. So that's 4.2 times 10 to the minus 2 meters per second squared. For the second part of question one, we've been given some further data. Um, so this is for two sets of readings, set A and set B. And here we've got the light gates in different positions on the air track. Now we're going to assume the acceleration is the same in each case, which it says in the question. And we need to use this data here to explain how the distance between the light gates is bigger uh, in uh, reading B than over here. So effectively in reading A, we've got the light gates close together. For reading B, the light gates are going to be further apart. Well, looking at the data, um, the time spent in the light gates for B, for both the first and the second, the time spent in the light gates was less, and that means it must have been traveling quicker. So what we can say is that for B, is that less time was spent in the light gates at both the first and the second light gate, and that means the initial velocity u and the final velocity v must both have been greater. So for reading b, the, the glider was travelling faster. But even though it's travelling faster, it still took longer to get from the first to the second. So if it's travelling quicker, and it took longer to get from the first to the second light gate, that means the light gates must have been further apart. 
Now you could of course analyze the data and you could use CVAT equations to actually work out the value of the distance between the light gates. But effectively what I'm saying here is that even though the cart was traveling quicker, and we can uh, infer that from the data here, it also took longer to get between the gates. And that means even at a higher velocity, it must have been traveling a greater distance to go from the first to the second. So that was my answer to question 1.2. And I think a lot of students found this one quite difficult and very few students managed to get both marks. Anyway, let's go on to the third part of question one. So this question had a graph where we had some data plotted and what we had to do was put in our line of best fit. Now this is why you do need a 30 centimeter clear ruler. Just line it up so you've got uh, approximately the same number of points above and below the line. And then we're gonna draw a straight line like that. Now I think this is a question that lots of students found fairly straightforward. Once you've drawn your line, it, you then need to draw a triangle onto the graph. So um, this just shows where you're taking your point to work out the gradient. So big triangles are essential. And once you've drawn your big triangle as big as possible, you can then look at your coordinates uh, for the points which are actually on that line of best fit. So to work out the gradient, um, we know that the gradient is going to be equal to the change in y by the change in x value. When I did this, um, looking at the paper, the values I got were the change in y value went from 0 0.40 um, at the top. It wasn't 0 at the bottom, it was 0 0.05. So 0 0.05, and it's just worth taking care when you actually read um, the points and just, you know, just double check the numbers that you're using. And across the bottom, um, mine went from 8.8 .8 up here back to 1 over here. So then it's a simple case of this is 0.35 divided by 7.8, which gave me an answer of 0 0.04487. But I guess in reality, I can only um, take my readings from the graph to maybe two significant figures. So this is then equal to 4.5 times 10 to the minus 2. OK, and I suppose also, uh, strictly speaking, because we're looking at the gradient and we've got something in metres per second squared divided by a number, the units for this would be metres per second squared, although you don't need that to actually get the mark. So this question here generally answered pretty well. Just a simple case of drawing in your line of best fit, drawing a large triangle and then showing how you actually work out that gradient. In the next part of the question, um, it gives us a new formula that says G is equal to 2 big G over H. And what we want to do is find the value of h. Now we've already got the value of g that the student has of 9.8 meters per second squared. We just worked out the gradient last time as equal to 4.5 times 10 to the minus 2. And we're going to rearrange this to make h the subject to so say that h is equal to 2g over little g. So that's 2 times 4.5 times 10 to the minus 2 divided by 9.8. So let's see, 4.5 times 10 to the minus 2 multiplied by 2 divided by 9.8 gives me a value of 9.18367. And again, what I'm going to do here is give my answer to two significant figures like the raw data that we've got here and the raw data there. So the answer is going to be 9.2 times 10 to the minus 3 metres. Okay, so for this question here, um, you would have been penalised if you had more than two significant figures because we can only justifiably give our final answer to the least amount of significant figures given to us in the question. The next part of the question gets a little bit mathematical and what you need to do is describe, without drawing another graph, how you could show that the, the data in that last question that we have over here how do we know that the acceleration is directly proportional to n? Now we can see there's a linear region on the graph, but how do you know it's directly proportional? Well, basically what you've got to do is from that line of best fit, you need to take a value of x and y. And what you then need to do is substitute these values into the equation y equals mx plus c. And if you do this, what you can then do is work out the value for your y-intercept. So effectively what we can say is that the y-intercept is going to be equal to a value from y um, take away the gradient times a value from the x-axis. Now, if you've got something which is directly proportional, then the y-intercept will be zero. It's going to start at the origin. Okay, so basically if you take values of x, which was the acceleration, 
sorry, if you take values of x, which was the number on the bottom, and y, which was the acceleration, you've got your gradient m that you calculated previously, you should find that c equals zero, and therefore that means what we have is a straight line through the origin. And if you've got a straight line through the origin, you then have something which is directly proportional, and therefore we can say the acceleration is proportional to n. So this is not drawing another graph, it's taking some data from the graph, so points on that line of best fit, with your calculated gradient to confirm that the intercept of that data is the origin of the axis. So that was question one. Now question two was about a couple of ring magnets on a wooden rod. Now you might have seen one of these at school. Unfortunately I can't have one here to show you in the video because it's currently locked down and the school that I work in is shut. But um, what we're going to look at is some of the measurements that were made of the ring magnet. So this is my kind of cross section of that circular magnet and this is my digital vernier caliper. So what you can do is you can basically use this to work out certain measurements. So you might want to look at the total measurement or you might want to look at the measurements of individual parts. So what precautions should the student take to reduce the amount of systematic and random errors when making the measurement of the total outside diameter which is d of that ring magnet? Now to reduce the effect of systematic errors with a caliper what you need to do is shut the jaws and then check that the reading is zero and if it isn't zero you need to make sure that you reset it. So um, what we want to do is we want to check that the caliper reads zero when the jaws are shut and if it doesn't read zero then you need to either reset it or you need to make sure you account for that in all of your subsequent measurements. But how do we stop random error? So to reduce the effect of random error what you can do is make sure that you take the readings at at least three points. This allows you to check for any anomalies and also allows you to calculate a mean of those results and it actually therefore checks that you've got the right value for the outside diameter of that thing. So you want to measure at three points and take a mean of those values and that reduces the chance of having a random error in that measurement. So the caliper gives a reading of 19.32 and that's the internal diameter of that hole on the magnet. So how do we do that? Well we use the top parts of the caliper over here because what you can do is you can adjust this inwards and then you pull it out and if you put this inside that hole, you pull it out until the top parts of the caliper are kind of pushing against this. So when it comes to drawing your diagram, you need to make sure that you just do a quick sketch that shows the, effectively the um, cross section of that magnet. And the inner parts here should be touching these parts over here of the caliper. So that's how you get the one mark for question 2.2. So these are the dimensions of that ring magnet. We've got the thickness, which has been measured as 12.09. The internal diameter is 19.32, and that's the external diameter. Now, to work out the volume, what we can do is if we work out the volume of the outside, and then we take away the volume of the inside hole, we can say that the volume is going to be equal to pi d squared over 4, and that's how to work out the surface area using the diameter. And we're going to multiply that by the thickness. And we're going to take away the internal volume, which is pi d squared over 4 multiplied by t. OK, so what we have here is um, the outside diameter, and we've got the inside diameter. And I've just, um, I, I could have kind of halved that, I suppose, to make it the radius. But I think this is a maybe more simple way of doing it. We can then say that that is equal to pi t over 4 multiplied by d squared minus little d squared. And if we put the numbers in from up here, that's going to be equal to pi multiplied by the thickness, which is 12.09 times 10 to the minus 3, because we're converting from millimetres to metres. Divide that by 4. Then the outside diameter is 59.90 times 10 to the minus 3. And that's squared. Take away, we'll have 19.32 times 10 to the minus 3, all squared. Uh, and this one here, it's a straightforward calculation, but just take care on your calculator that you're not making any mistakes. And this gives me an answer of 3.05255. Now the raw data here has been given to four significant figures, so I'm going to quote my final answer to four significant figures. So that's 3.0525, so that's going to be 0 
and that's times 10 to the minus 5 cubic metres. So that's um, straightforward mathematics, but it's just easy to get uh, mistaken about which values of d that you use. Um, and also, there's obviously potential for making a mistake on your calculator. So if you have time, maybe at the end of the exam, go back and just check your calculation. So all I did there was I worked out the outside volume, took away the inside volume to get the volume of that ring magnet. Now the last part of question 2.4 was about how you could carry out an experiment using this apparatus where you're adding different masses of clay to the upper magnet and basically the student said that the force is equal to k which is some kind of constant over the height cubed. Okay now this is something that you probably will never have done at school but that doesn't matter it's about how you can actually approach this kind of practical work to get some valid data to show that that's true. So first of all, what you can do are take measurements when that magnet is in equilibrium. And if it's in equilibrium, then the force is going to be equal to the weight acting down. Now this weight acting down is equal to the mass of the magnet, so I'm going to call that Mb, plus also the mass of the clay. And that's all going to be multiplied by the gravitational field strength of 9.81. So we can work out the weight which is pushing down, which must be equal and opposite to the force, the magnetic force pushing up. So what we can do is we can work out our values of F. Now what we can do is we can choose different values of mass of clay. And what we're looking at ideally are at least seven different values, because what we can then do is we can get some data with seven values of MC, which we can then give seven values of the force, and that will then also give us seven values of h. So if we were doing this um, with a table, you might have uh, values of mc, you then get your value for f, and then you could get your value of h, which is what we're going to be measuring. But we really want to see how this is related to k. And what we can think about is if we rearrange this, we can say that k is equal to f h cubed. Okay, now if we just plot a graph of f against h, that doesn't give us k, but what we can do is be a bit clever and say then that k is equal to f divided by 1 over h cubed. Okay, so that means if we get values of 1 divided by h cubed, we can then start to plot a graph that might look a bit like this. And when you get some data from maybe seven different uh, data points, ideally, if this relationship is true, we should get a straight line that goes through the origin. Now, the reason for this is that if f equals k over h cubed, then k equals f h cubed, or k is equal to f over 1 over h cubed. Now, this thing here is equal to the gradient, because the gradient of this line is going to be equal to the change in y value f divided by the change in x value, which is 1 over h cubed, and that should then be equal to our constant k. Now, if this um, is actually true, then we should get a straight line that does indeed go through the origin. So this would then give us a straight line of best fit. So in answer to the question, um, what you'd be doing is, this is kind of sort of the physics, but you need to maybe think about how you can set this out in a logical format. So you might talk about the procedure that could be used. So perhaps you measure out different values of clay uh, and you record the mass using a mass balance. You then add those one at a time to the upper magnet. You record the values for the mass of clay added. You work out the force and also you're measuring h. So when it comes to measuring h, you need to make sure that you're using maybe a ruler and a set square. And that allows you to get accurate values which have low uncertainty. You then plot a graph of f against 1 over h cubed. And if you do have a straight line of best fit, then that shows that this relationship up here is true. So a lot of stuff there that is quite tricky because you know it takes a bit of a leap of faith to think about uh, this equation and how that data that you might plot can actually show this relationship is true. But that was question 2.4. And again, it's about the experimental technique that we have in physics, even if it's using simple equipment, but used in a slightly different way to what you're used to. So question three was looking at some alpha particles which have a certain amount of kinetic energy. And we also know the specific charge of them is 4.81 times 10 to the 7 coulombs per kilogram. 
And the first part is a show question. So it's given you the answer that you should be aiming for. We want to get an answer of about 2 times 10 to the 7 metres per second. But um, we need to actually show how we get to it. So what do we know? Well, we know that the kinetic energy is equal to a half mv squared. OK, so we know the kinetic energy. We don't know the velocity, but that's what we're trying to find out. But we don't know the mass of this alpha particle. So how do we work out the mass? Well, we do know the specific charge. Now, that means then that the charge on the alpha particle divided by the mass is going to be equal to this number up here, which is 4.81 times 10 to the 7. To work out the mass then, that's just going to be equal to the charge divided by the specific charge, so 4.1 times 10 to the 7, and the charge on this alpha particle, because it's got two protons and two neutrons, is going to be equal to 2 times the elementary charge, so that's 3.2 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. I'm going to divide that by 4.81 times 10 to the 7, and if I do this, we get a mass equal to 6.6528 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So what we can now do is use this value of mass in the equation over here. But we're going to rearrange this to say that the velocity is going to be equal to 2 times its kinetic energy divided by the mass. And we're going to square root all of that. And the mass that we're going to be using comes from up here. So that means then that the velocity is going to be 2 times kinetic energy, which is... 8.1 times 10 to the minus 31. Divide that by the mass, which we worked out as 6.6528. So I'm going to keep the raw data on my calculator. So I'm not going to, um, uh, I guess, simplify that too. Early. I'm going to keep as many significant figures as possible. Um, and that's times 10 to the minus 27. And we're going to square root all of that. So that is equal to a value of 15604687. Um, also, I, I kind of wrote down 31, but that should be to the minus 13 over minus 27. So this gives us an answer equal to 1.56 times 10 to the 7 metres per second. Now, effectively, if we were to look at that to one significant figure, that would be the same as 2 times 10 to the 7 metres per second. So in this show me question, what I've done is I've written down the equations I'm going to use. I've not rounded down too early. And also I've quoted my answer to more significant figures than the show uh, the value that's given in the question. So that shows I've actually carried out the calculation myself. So that is the answer for 3.1. Now, it says that it um, alpha particles can travel through air in straight lines with a range of about 3.5 centimetres. So a very short range particle because they're relatively heavy. And we want to calculate the average force exerted by the alpha particle as it's stopped by the air. Now for this one over here, if we're looking at the force, um, a lot of students might think, okay, well F equals ma, and if you know the mass of this from up here, and you know it's tra it's travelling 3.5 centimetres, we could then maybe work out the acceleration. But there is a simpler way. Because what we have to think about is that the work done is equal to the force times distance. And effectively, this work here is going to be equal to the kinetic energy. So there's work against um, its kinetic energy. And therefore, if we know its initial kinetic energy, we know how far it's travelled, we can work out the force. So the force is going to be equal to its initial kinetic energy, which was 8.1 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. We divide that by the distance, because uh, W over S is equal to F. The distance was 0 0.035, and that then gives a force, so 8.1 times 10 to the minus 13 divided by 0.35. This gives an answer of 2.3 times 10 to the minus 11 newtons. Okay, so this one here, you could use this and some suvat, and you would get to the same answer, but the quickest way to do it is just to say that effectively work is being done um, against its initial store of kinetic energy, um, and that's a force provided by the air over that distance. So for question 3.3, we know that for every centimetre that this alpha particle travels, it makes 5.1 times 10 to the 4 ions, and it travels a total distance of 3.5 centimetres. 
And we also know that this initially had a value of 8.1 times 10 to the minus 13 joules of energy. So effectively, all of the energy that was initially in the alpha particle has caused all of these events. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to convert this from joules into electron volts. Now you've got to remember that one electron volt is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this number by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And that means that in electron volts, this is equal to 5.0625 times 10 to the 6 electron volts. So we've converted into electron volts. We also need to know the total number of ions created. So the total number of ions is going to be equal to the amount of ions per centimetre, so 5.1 times 10 to the 4, multiplied by the range of 3.5, which is 178,500 ions. So this means that that amount of energy causes that amount of ionisation events. So if we want to look at the ionisation energy for one atom, that's going to be equal to the total amount of energy, so 5.0625 times 10 to the 6, divided by the amount of ions created, 178,500. And this gives an answer of 28.36. Now, we can only quote our final answer to two significant figures, like the raw data up here. So that's equal to 28 electron volts as the ionisation energy. So this is a spark counter, and effectively when you bring your radioactive source, which is over here, um, as that starts to ionise the air between the, the wire gauze at the top and the bottom bit here, you see this kind of amazing crackling effect. It's just really impressive. So what it says here is that um, there's a current of 0.85 milliamps for a time of 1.2 nanoseconds. And we want to know the total number of charge carriers that pass through. So the first thing we're going to do is look at the total amount of charge transferred. So remember, Q is equal to IT. Now here the current is 0 0.85 times 10 to the minus 3 amps, and the time is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 9 seconds. So nano is 10 to the minus 9. So we're going to work at the total charge transferred first of all. So 0 0.85 times 10 to the minus 3 multiplied by 1.2 times... 10 to the minus 9 gives us an answer equal to 1.02 times 10 to the minus 12 coulombs. So not much charge transferred. But we want to know the total amount of charge carriers. And here you need to remember that the total charge is going to be equal to the number of charge carriers times the charge on each ion. Okay, so if each ion has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, we can then use this to work out n. So n is going to be equal to q over the elementary charge, which is 1.02 times 10 to the minus 12, divided by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And this gives an answer of 6,375,000. So the total number then is going to be equal to 6.4 times 10 to the 6. So that's how many ions are actually moving when we have this current flowing for that amount of time. For question 3.5, again, we've got the same spark counter over here. And what we had was this radioactive source being moved from a distance of 10 centimetres towards it. Now, what's the potential difference going to be um, across the gap and how's that going to change? Well, effectively, when the source is 10 centimetres away, there's going to be no ionisation because the range of this radiation is only about 3.5 centimetres. So at 10 centimetres, there's going to be no ionisation and that's because the range of alpha radiation is about 3.5 centimetres. But when it gets closer, for example, this is maybe now 3.5 centimetres away, it can then cause ionisation events inside. And when ionisation occurs, this means that charge carriers are liberated in the air gap. And what that effectively means is that the resistance of effectively this bit of the circuit here, the resistance of this bit goes down, and that then allows a current to start flowing. In actual fact, in the previous part of the question, in part 3.4, we knew the size of the current that was flowing for that very small amount of time. So what we found, actually, was that the current was equal to 0 0.85 milliamps. And 
we can then use this to actually work out the size of the potential difference. So this was the current flowing everywhere in the circuit. If we look at this resistor, because effectively there's going to be, we can think of the equivalent resistance of this air gap, and there's this resistor here, and they're both in series. So the resistance of the big resistor was 5.0 mega ohms, and we knew that there must be a current at some point of 0 0.85 milliamps going through it. Now we can therefore work out the potential difference across that large resistor, and we know that V is equal to I times R. So here the potential difference across the big 5, ohm 5 mega ohm resistor is equal to 0 0.85 times 10 to the minus 3, multiplied by 5.0 times 10 to the 6. And that means the potential difference across this component was equal to 4,250 volts. Now think about Kirchhoff's second law. We've got the sum, this is the EMF for 4,500. There's 4,250 here, which means if we're to think about the potential difference across this part of the circuit, across the air gap, that means the potential difference across the air gap is going to be equal to 4,500 take away 4,250, which is equal to 250 volts. So that means we can say that the potential difference across the air gap was about 250 volts when the alpha source was close enough to cause ionisation. Now this was a difficult question, and I think only about 10% of students managed to get any marks at all. Um, so if you're one of the 90% who didn't score anything, don't worry about it too much. But hopefully you can understand what I've done here. What we're looking at is when you've got the alpha source far enough away, then the PD across this bit is going to be zero because no current is flowing. When it gets close enough though, the ionization occurs, we liberate charge carriers and this allows this current to flow. And if we know the current in the circuit, we can work out the potential difference across this resistor and therefore work out the potential difference across that air gap. So that was question 3.5. That was pretty tricky. So question 4.1 is looking at the refraction of light. Now, the thing about this is normally we look at maybe light going from air to glass or glass to air or something like that. Here, we have glass A and we also have glass B. And what we've been given in the question is the refractive index of glass A, um, but we don't know the refractive index of glass B. We do also know the speed that... Um, let's imagine that in glass A the speed is equal to C metres per second, well, here, the speed is going to be less than that. And it's going to be 3.252% less. OK, so that's a little bit tricky to kind of work out. Now, um, what's the relationship between the refractive index and the speed? Well, what we could say is that Na times Ca is going to be equal to Nb times Cb. OK, so this is the relationship, so that's going to be a constant value. So the refractive index times the speed is going to be a constant value. And what we can then say is that Na over Nb is equal to Cb over Ca. OK, and we want to find Nb, so we can say that Nb is equal to Na multiplied by Ca over Cb. OK, so hopefully that makes sense. So if we know the refractive index of this glass and we know the ratio of the speeds, we don't need to know the exact number because that's why, although it's 3.252% less, um, that's absolutely fine because it's the ratio of these two things we need to know about. We can then use this to find our answer to NB. So NB is going to be NA, which is 1.461. Now, um, the speed in A is going to be, let's say it's 100, What's going to be the speed in B? Well, we're going to have something which is 3.252% less. So 3.25% so less than that is 96.748. So we're going to do 100 divided by this number, and then we're going to multiply that by 1.461. And this gives me an answer for the refractive index of glass B to be equal to one51 zero. Now, we've been given this data here to four significant figures, we've been given that data to four significant figures, and therefore we're going to give the final answer to four significant figures as well. And there are no units because um, 
the refractive index is basically just the ratio of another couple of numbers. And what you should also realise is that because the glass is slowing down the light, because it's travelling slower than it was before, then this must have a higher refractive index than this. So if you got an answer which was less than 1.46, it would have meant that you maybe had these numbers the wrong way around. So this is the refractive index of glass B. Now in question 4.2, it gives you loads of new data. We've got an optical fibre, which is used as a strain gauge. And strain gauges are used to measure very, very small changes in length. And what we can see here is that the strain, or the change in length, tells us about how this affects lambda r. So lots of new information. And it says that this has been attached to a cable that's used to raise and lower a lift. So the lift is initially at rest, and then it accelerates downwards for a short time before reaching a constant velocity. So discuss how the value of lambda r changes. So first of all, um, when it's at rest, let's think about that initially. When it's at rest, we're going to have on that cable the weight of the lift which is hanging down, and this is going to be supported by the tension in the cable. So initially we can say that the tension is equal to the weight. Okay. Now what's that got to do with strain? Well, we've got to think about a kind of what the engineering kind of cable is like. So here we have maybe the cross section of the cable. Now there's going to be a tension acting in it, and that tension is going to be causing a force. And this also has a cross-sectional area. And if you've got a force and you've got an area, we can then look at the stress. Okay, so stress is equal to force divided by area. This material also has a young modulus, which is E. And also we have the strain. And the strain is equal to the change in length over the original length. Now, because there's this link that says a young modulus is equal to the stress divided by the strain, then this is always going to be a constant value. And what we can then say is that initially the stress is proportional to the strain. So when you've got a higher stress, we've got a higher strain. And we have a higher stress when we have a higher force or tension in that cable. So effectively what we can say is that the tension is going to be proportional to the change in L. Okay, so what we're saying here is that because the young modulus is equal to stress over strain. Um, this ratio is going to be the same. So effectively, the strain is going to be proportional to the tension in that cable. When it's under more force, it's going to be effectively a little bit longer. Now, initially, this is what happens. We've got the tension is equal to the weight, and that means the tension is going to be a constant value, and therefore it's going to have a constant strain. So perhaps it's on the graph something a bit like this. So initially when it's at rest, we find that lambda r is a constant. But what happens when the lift moves down? Now when the lift is moving down, the weight of that lift is going to be exactly the same. So w is going to be the same, but there must be a downwards resultant force which is causing a downwards resultant acceleration. And that means the size of the tension in the cable is going to reduce. So we can see here that the tension is now going to be smaller than the weight and because tension is proportional to delta L that means the strain is going to be less and effectively now the strain value is going to be less so we're moving to this part of the graph over here and that then means that the value for lambda r is going to be smaller so when it accelerates down we find that the strain reduces and the wavelength lambda r gets smaller. But what happens when that lift is now moving down at a constant velocity? Well again at this point what we know is that the weight of that lift must be equal to the tension in the cable because it's now moving at a constant velocity, there's no resultant force, there's no resultant acceleration and what happens now is that the value of lambda r increases just like it was when it, when it was at rest. So now what we find is that the value of lambda r increases to a constant value. So think about what happens. The strain, when it's still, it's up here. When it moves to this point, when the 
lift is accelerating and then when the lift gets to a constant speed it moves up to this point so lambda r would go from this value it would decrease and then it would increase and stay at that increased value once again so this one here is a question about using forces and if we know what's happening with the forces we can then work out what's happening with the strain and if we know what's happening with the strain we can then look at the wavelength so that was question 4.2 so this graph here shows two different type of optical fibre strain gauges, we've got P and Q. And it says in the question that the engineer wants to measure small accelerations. Now if we have small accelerations, that means there's going to be a small change in the, in the strain. So what we're looking at is the value on this axis isn't going to be very big. But we want to make sure that our measurements are as um, certain as possible. And what we want, therefore, is something that has a big change in lambda r for a small change in strain. Now, if we had q, we might have a change, you know, maybe if it went from here to here, the change in q is going to be quite small. But for the same change in strain for p, it's going to have a much larger change in lambda r. And therefore, p gives a greater change in lambda r. And that means that we've got less uncertainty in the measurement. Or we could also say that this is a greater resolution. So this question is all about how we can measure small accelerations. And what we want then is a very small strain to give us the largest range of possible values, which means that our measurements are going to be a lot more certain and reduce any uncertainties in those measured values. So that was the end of the first part of the paper. Now we're going to have a look at the multiple choice questions. And there were a lot of these to get through. So when it comes to multiple choice answers, don't forget that what you need to do is you need to fill in the lozenge in that thing. If you want to change your answer, um, don't forget that you need to cross it through and then put in your answer. But if you then want to change it back to this, you then need to kind of put a circle around it. So um, just a bit of a sort of exam technique there. Now, the other thing in terms of exam technique is you need to do your working by the question. So even if it's multiple choice, you still need to show your working out so that you know that you've gone through the right method to get to the right answer. So the first one, um, we had a graph where we had the proton number down here and the number of neutrons up here. And we had these points P, Q and R. Now it said, um, which of these identifies an isotope of P? Well, basically, if you've got an isotope, it must have the same number of protons, and therefore P and Q must be isotopes of each other, so it can't be R, and that means what I'm going to do initially is just get rid of this answer and this one over here. So I've gone from four answers down to two. The next bit said we then need to identify the nucleon number of this isotope of P. Now, the nucleon number is the number of protons plus neutrons. So for I element Q, it's got X protons plus the number of neutrons is Y plus 1. And therefore, the answer is B. Q, um, this one here where Q and Y plus 1, that just tells you the number of neutrons, but we want the nucleon number, and therefore that's not the correct answer. So for 5, that's why the answer is B. Now for question 6 we had some uranium that decayed through several decays and I guess there would be alpha and beta decays but we want to know how many alpha decays there were. Now an alpha decay, 4-2, uh, means that four particles leave the nucleus. Okay. Now initially there were 236 there, eventually we had 204 and that meant 32 um, protons and neutrons were ejected from the nucleus during this stage. Now if there are 32 things left in total and we had 4 leaving with each alpha emission then 32 divided by 4 is equal to 8 and that means the answer is C. Now we couldn't reuse the bottom number because although that number has decreased by 10 that doesn't tell us how many alpha decays happened because there might have been some beta decays as well. Now with the beta decay, that doesn't change the number at the top, the A number, um, and therefore we need to ignore the number at the bottom when we're looking at the total number of alpha decays. We're just looking at the number at the top. That's the one that's important. For question seven, we've got a Feynman diagram and it shows something where it's got electron capture. Now, here we've got something which is made out of an up, an up, and a down quark, and here this must be a proton. 
Now, if you've got a proton, which is effectively capturing an electron, it's going to end up making a neutron. Now, this quark doesn't change. This quark doesn't change. But if we know that we started with a proton and we end up with a neutron, then you should recall that the structure of the neutron is down, up, down. So what we've had is an up quark turns into a down quark. And then that's also going to give out this uh, electron neutrino here and that kind of something is happening over here. So, first of all, what is the structure of this particle up here? Well, it's going to be down, up, down. So it can't be the answer A and it can't be the answer C. So we're going to get rid of those. And now we need to look at, is this a W plus or a W minus? Now, at each one of these junctions, charge is conserved. Now, if we've got um, a negative thing coming in here, and then we've got something which is neutral, then there must be something positive coming this way. Equally, we could maybe recall the, the charge on an up quark and a down quark. And here we've got something which is plus two thirds to minus a third, and that means there must be a plus going this way. So Q is going to be something which is positive, and that's why the answer can't be a W minus, it has to be W plus, so that's why the answer is B. For this question here, it's worth recalling not only the structure of the kaons in terms of the, the quarks inside, but also the fact that kaons decay into pions. Now, what we have here is an anti-electron neutrino, so if that's if that lepton has been created, which is an anti-lepton, there must also be a lepton. So this one here should be a normal electron. So that means it can't be D. Um, and if you recall that kaons decay into pions, that's why it can't be um, the first or the second. And that's why the answer has to be C. For the next one, uh, we've got a graph where we have the kinetic energy of photoelectrons. And we've got one over the wavelength. Now, what does the gradient of this graph show? Well, a gradient is going to be equal to the energy divided by 1 over the wavelength, and that's then equal to the energy times the wavelength. But let's try and rem remember how that uh, relates to graphs to do with um, other bits and pieces. And you might recall that the energy of that uh, photon is going to be equal to hc over lambda, and that means h lambda is equal to hc. So this is a gradient. This is how we've worked it out by using this equation here for the energy of the instant uh, photons. And therefore, the gradient e lambda is equal to hc. And that's why the answer is equal to c. So in this question, we're looking at the excitation inside a fluorescent tube. We have an ultraviolet photon absorbed. And then that emits a photon of visible light. Now, ultraviolet photons are more energetic than visible light, and therefore the energy up must be bigger than the energy down. Now, what we have here are two photons being absorbed, or even four photons being absorbed, so it can't be either of these. It has to be either A or D. Now, if we had A, this is an ultraviolet photon being absorbed, and then it emits a photon with the same energy. So here it absorbs and emits the same thing, so it can't be this one, and that's why the answer is D. So D is the correct answer because this shows a high energy photon being absorbed and then a lower energy photon being emitted. So for question 11, um, we're looking at a particle which has a kinetic energy of E, and therefore what we can say is that the energy is going to be equal to a half mv squared. And we want to find the de Broglie wavelength of this particle. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is rearrange this to make v squared the subject. So we can say that v squared is equal to 2e divided by m. OK, so that's the first part. The second thing I'm going to do is that says the wavelength of um, a particle is equal to h over mv. Now, what we want to do is find an expression for the wavelength in terms of, um, I guess, some of these other bits here in terms of the energy. So what I'm going to do is say that lambda squared is equal to h squared over m squared v squared. OK, so what I've done is I've just squared every term in this thing here. And what I can then do is put in this over here. So we've got v squared over here, which I'm going to substitute in over there. So what we can then say is that lambda squared is equal to h squared over m squared. And then we've got v squared, which is equal to 2e 
over m. Now what we can see here is we've got m squared over m, so that means the one of the m's cancelled. So we can also write this as lambda squared is equal to h squared over 2em. And I'm going to square root both sides to say that lambda is going to be equal to h divided by the square root of 2em. Okay, and looking at uh, what's in the table, that's why d is the right answer. This one here took me a couple of attempts and it was quite tricky. But what we're looking at basically is this equation, that the kinetic energy and the de Broglie wavelength. And all I did was some manipulation to substitute this equation into this. And uh, yeah, that's where we got to the final answer over here. That was a little bit tricky. Luckily, the next one was OK. So which of these links both the photoelectric effect and electron diffraction to the properties of waves and particles? Well, the photoelectric effect tells us about the particle-like property of light. And therefore, we must have the particle property for A and C. So we're going to get rid of D, B, and we're going to get rid of D. But electron diffraction tells us about the wave-like property of electrons, and therefore it can't be this one here, because that's got a particle-like property. And that means the only answer it can be is C. For question 13, we've got some data about the uncertainty in different measured quantities. So we've got the length, the tension, and the mass per unit length. Now for this one here, the equation we, we can use is that frequency is equal to 1 over 2 times the length divided by, sorry, multiplied by the square root of t over the mass per unit length. Okay, so this is the equation that we can use to work out the frequency. Now, I'm just going to write that as frequency is equal to 1 over 2L multiplied by T over mu to a half. OK, and that's important. Now, what we're going to look at now are the percentage uncertainties in all of these values, and we're going to look at the total or combined uncertainty in F. Now, effectively, um, the 2 doesn't really have anything. That's just a number. And therefore, we're going to look at the uncertainty in the length which is 0 0.80. Okay, and it doesn't matter if we've got 1 over 2L or 1 over L, we're just going to add that uncertainty onto these. Now, the uncertainty in T is equal to 4, but what we're doing is we're square rooting that. Now, if we had T squared, what we do is we double that uncertainty. So if we had T squared, we'd have 2, pi, 2 times 4, which is equal to 8. If we had T cubed, we'd have 3 times 4, which is equal to 12. Because we've got t to a half, we're going to half the uncertainty. So we're going to add this to 4 divided by 2. And also because we've got mu down here, which is raised to the power of a half, we're going to look at half the uncertainty in that. So we've got 0.8 plus 2 plus 1. So that's going to be equal to 3.8. And that's why the answer is b. So this one here is quite tricky. It's very rare that we actually get uh, the uncertainties, whether the final uncertainty is going to be less than this value. But because we're taking the square root, that's why we're halving the uncertainty in t, halving the uncertainty in mu, and adding that to the uncertainty in l. Now for 14, we had a load of things um, of increasing magnitude. And my approach to this would be we're going to write them down in order. So first of all, we have femto, which is 10 to the minus 15, pico, 10 to the minus 12, nano, 10 to the minus 9, and then micro, milli, and then we have killer, giga, and tera. You have to know those, and you have to know femtos 10 to the minus 15, pico 10 to the minus 12, and so on. Once you've got those, it's actually quite straightforward to just look through these and work out which are correct and incorrect. And by a process of elimination, what you'll find is that D is the correct answer. For part 15, we had some glass and air. We wanted to find out which direction this ray of light travelled in. Now, the first thing I did was I worked out the critical angle. Now, we know that uh, sine of the critical angle is equal to n2 over n1. And here, that meant the critical angle, uh, theta c, is going to be equal to inverse sine of 1.0 over 1.5. So when I did that... This gave me a critical angle equal to 41.8 degrees. Now, over here, it said the angle of instance was 44, and here, 44 
is bigger than the critical angle and that means that we therefore have total internal reflection and that means the light must come this way at an angle of 44 degrees. Now if that's 44 degrees and it hits this other surface well we can think about the angle of instance now as the other angle in a triangle. So that's 44 degrees, that's 90, so this angle must be 46 degrees. And again here that angle 46 degrees is bigger than the critical angle and therefore we also get total internal reflection. So that means here the ray of light must come off in this direction down here which is choice D. So that's why we get basically internal reflection there, internal reflection there, and that's why D is the correct answer for 15. Now when I first looked at 16, it initially looked quite confusing because we had this formula here saying that the time it took is equal to NL over C sine theta. We had two different optical fibres, we had P and Q. But if you look a little bit closely, um, both of these travel at a speed of C, and therefore they're their speed is the same, and also the angle that they're travelling at is the same. Now what this means is that if they're travelling at a velocity of c, at an angle of theta, their horizontal component of velocity is going to be the same. So this would be equal to c sine theta. So both of these things have the same horizontal component of velocity, and that means they're going to take the same time to go from here to here, as it goes from here to here. So effectively, this width doesn't matter. And what that means is that if we want to find out how long it takes, we just need exactly the same formula of NL over C sine theta, which is option A. So for this one over here, it's not as complicated as it first looks. Effectively, they're both traveling at the same angle, at the same speed, and therefore their horizontal motion is gonna be the same. So now we have a string which is vibrating at its fundamental frequency. Um, so let's think about, you know, here's the string maybe fixed at both ends. The fundamental frequency is going to look like this. So there's a node, an anti-node, and a node. It then says that the string is touched a third of the way from the end. So that must mean that there must be a node at each end, and also there must be a node of no displacement a third along or two thirds of the way along that. Now if we think about what this wave looks like, it's gonna go down and up and down. And I guess its other positions would be like that. Now if that's F, that one there must be equal to three F. So that's why the answer is D. So this question is about diffraction gratings, and what we know is that d sine theta is equal to n lambda. Now in this question here we've been given uh, lambda, we know that n is equal to 1, and we can work out theta because what we have is this distance and this distance, and therefore we can use that to find theta. Now theta is going to be equal to inverse tan of the opposite side, 0 0.30, divided by the adjacent side, which is 1.5. So that means theta is equal to 11.3 degrees. Now this then means that d is equal to lambda over sine theta from this equation up here. So lambda was 6.5 times 10 to the minus 7. Divide, divide that by sine of 11.5. And this gives a value of d equal to 3.31 times 10 to the minus 6. But that is not the answer. That is the spacing between the lines, but it's not the number of lines per millimetre. So what we're going to look at is if that's the spacing, I'm going to do 1 divided by that to get 300,000 as the lines per metre. I'm going to divide that by another 1,000 to then get lines per millimetre. And that's why the answer is equal to 3.0 times 10 to the 2 lines per millimetre, which is why C is the correct answer. So this one here, a little bit tricky because you had a multi-step thing over here to work out D, but then we had to do 1 over D to find the lines per metre, and then divide by 1,000 to get the lines per millimetre. So that's why this is the right answer, and the answer is C. So in this question, it gives us some information about a progressive wave. So I'm just going to draw my wave underneath. 
and it says that two points are at a phase difference of pi over 6. Now one wave is 2 pi radians, so that means half a wavelength is pi radians, and we're looking at a point here and maybe here. So effectively what we're saying is that a twelfth of that wave length is pi over 6 radians apart. So what's the wavelength? Well the wavelength is going to be equal to the, well it's got a phase difference of pi over 6, um, the distance between the points is 0 0.12 metres, so 0 0.12 metres is a twelfth of a wave, so we're going to multiply this by 12 to get our wavelength. So that's 0.12 times 12, which equals 1.44 metres. Now we want to know the frequency. Uh, frequency is going to be equal to the wave speed divided by the wavelength, uh, and that's going to be equal to 340 divided by 1.44, which equals 236. And to two significant figures, that's going to be 240, and that's why the correct answer is A. You know, I'm doing a lot of writing, and this pen is starting to run out. You might see how it's getting thinner than it was at the start of the video. So let's hope this keeps, uh, keeps working till the end of this video. So now we've got a bird sitting on a uniform rod um, hung from vertical wires. So it says that the bird has a weight, sorry, the bird has a weight of 2w and is x distance from this end, and the rod has a weight of w and is 15 centimetres long. So that means on the diagram I'm going to put another arrow to be w, and that's going to be equal to 7.5 centimetres from the end. Now, um, what do we know? Well, basically, um, if we think about the forces, first of all, okay, um, if we think about resolving the forces up and down, because it's an equilibrium, that must mean the total weight down, which is w plus 2w, and this weight down must be equal to the tension in P and, and the tension in Q. Now it says, what's the value of x when the tension in P is half the tension in Q? So we're going to say that this has got a tension of t, and let's say that's got a tension of 2t. Okay, so that means the total tension upwards is going to be equal to t plus 2t. And that means we can say that 3w down is equal to 3t up, or w is equal to t. Okay, so that's going to be useful later on. Now let's also take moments about P. Okay, so we're going to just take moments about P here. So there's going to be, um, going clockwise, we're going to have a moment due to the weight of that rod, which is equal to 7.5 times W. We're also going to have an and a clockwise moment due to the weight of the bird, which is going to be at a distance of X times a value of 2w, and that's going to be equal to the anti-clockwise moment, which is equal to a distance of 15, multiplied by the value here, which is 2t. Okay, now, first of all, we know that, um, let me just write this again, but actually what we can say is because 2t must be equal to 2w, because w is equal to t, we can say that 7.5w plus 2xw is equal to 15 times 2t, so that's going to be the same as 30w. We can then get all, all the w's, they will cancel, and therefore we can say that 7.5 plus 2x is equal to 30. 2x is therefore equal to 30, take away 7.5 is 22.5, and that means x is going to be equal to 11.25. So, to three significant figures, um, I guess like the distance here of 15.0 centimetres, that's going to be equal to 11.3 centimetres, and that's why the answer is C. So in this question, we have a car which is moving up a hill at a steady speed, and that means there's going to be no net force acting on it, but we know there's a weight acting down, and that means there's also going to be a component of weight acting down the slope. Now the component of weight acting down the slope must be equal to the component of the force, the thrust, the driving force of the engine of the car going up there. We can then work out the component of weight acting down the slope. Okay, so what we can say is that if that's 12 degrees, then that angle in there is also 12 degrees. 
and that means the co component of weight acting down the slope is going to be equal to the weight of the car, so 950 times 9.81, multiplied by sine theta. And this is going to, then going to be equal to the driving force of the car, F. Okay, So the driving force, F, is equal to 950 times 9.81 times sine of 12, and that's equal to 1938. Okay, now we want to know the velocity, and you should recall that power is equal to the force times velocity. So the velocity is equal to the power divided by the force. So the power is 65 times 10 to the 4 watts divided by the force, which is 1938 newtons. And this gives me an answer equal to 33.55. So again, to two significant figures, that's equal to 34. And that's why the answer for this one is C. For 22, uh, we've got a girl bouncing on a trampoline. And assuming that her air resi resistance is negligible, what's her acceleration? So when she's in the air, the only force acting on her is her weight. And that means her acceleration is going to be downwards the whole time. And her acceleration is due to the gravitational field strength. And it doesn't matter if she's going up or going down, she's going to be constantly accelerating towards the ground. So in terms of her acceleration, it doesn't change once she's in the air, and that's why it's constant, and that's why the answer is B. So for this one here, um, what I did was I said that the energy stored is going to be equal to a half K delta L squared. Okay, so the energy stored depends on the stiffness and the extension. Now in the table it gives us data for the energy stored and the stiffness, but what we want to know is which of these is going to extend the least. Okay, so I'm going to rearrange this to say that the extension is going to be equal to 2 times the energy divided by the stiffness square rooted. Now what this means is that um, effectively the change in length is going to be proportional to the square root of E over K. Now what I can then do is I can put in uh, another column here to look at my values of E over K square rooted. I can then find which is the minimum value. So for this one here we've got the square root of 1 divided by 4. So this gives me an answer equal to 0 0.5. For this one over here, e over k is going to be 1 divided by 9. We're going to square root that to give an answer of 0 0.33. This one over here, we've got 3 divided by 16 square rooted, gives an answer of 0 0.43. And the last one, 3 divided by 25 square rooted, gives an answer of 0 0.346. So when we put the numbers in, we find that this one over here, B, has the smallest value. So if we were to calculate it, we would find that B, for this stiffness and this energy stored, extends the least. And I suppose it's storing the least amount of energy and it's the stiffest, which is why B is the right answer. Uh, for 24, we've got two spheres that have the same volume, but they've got a different mass. So let's say we've got P and Q. Uh, so that's Q there, P, the one I've coloured in, um, has a greater mass. What's going to be the relationship between VP and VQ when they're travelling um, at terminal velocity? Well, let's think about a free body diagram. Okay, When this one Q is travelling at terminal velocity, it's going to have a certain weight downwards, which depends on its mass, and the drag force is going to be equal to the weight. When P is moving down, it's got a bigger weight, and therefore it must have a bigger drag force. And because the drag force is related to not just the volume but how quick it's going, if D is bigger, that must mean it's also travelling at a greater velocity. So what we can say is that VP is going to be v bigger than the velocity of Q. So that means that we get rid of C, because it can't be that, um, and it can't be B, and actually it can't be A either. So it must be D. D is the only one that has a, an option here where the velocity of P must be bigger than the velocity of Q. Okay, so um, yeah, 
D is the correct answer for 24. So for 25, we've got a plane which has a velocity of V, but there's also going to be a component acting against it due to the wind. And what we're looking at is um, the time it takes to fly a distance D due north. Now, we know that um, the time taken is going to be equal to the displacement divided by the velocity. Um, and the displacement here, S, in the vertical direction is going to be equal to D. But what's its vertical velocity? Well, effectively, even though it's going V up here, there's going to be U at an angle of theta taken away. So what you can actually work out its resultant vertical component of velocity as equal to V minus something U something theta. And what we have over here is because of um, the angle here being theta, we're going to look at this length down here. That means we need to use cos. So this is its vertical component of velocity, v minus u cos theta. That's the distance it goes. And then if we look at the options, that then comes out as a being the correct option. Now this one was tricky because we had a force time graph. So looking how the force increases and decreases over time. We had to link that to a graph of the momentum of that object. Now, force is proportional to the rate of change of momentum. Okay, that's Newton's second law. What that means is that if we were to look at a momentum time graph, the gradient is going to tell us about the size of the force. So what we want to see is, on the graphs here, which gradient goes from a low value to a high value to a low value. And actually, the answer is D. So what we can see here is that initially the gradient is zero, when the force is zero. We then have a maximum gradient in the middle, which is where we've got our maximum force over here. And then as time goes on, the gradient gets less as the force gets less. So for this one over here, it was tricky, but D is the correct answer. And it's because the gradient of a momentum time graph is equal or proportional to the force being applied. And again, we can see here that the force goes from zero to a maximum and then back down to a zero. So in this paper, they really talk about objects P and Q quite a lot. Um, basically, the two things are both at rest initially, and then the same resultant force is applied for the same amount of time. Now, you've got to remember, of course, that force equals mass times acceleration. And if we're having the same force being applied, then the acceleration is going to depend on the mass of the object. If you've got something which is 10 times heavier, it's going to have 10 times lower acceleration. And also we know that the acceleration is going to be proportional to that final velocity. So if you've got a higher acceleration, we're going to have a higher velocity. Now, it says here that the mass of P is 10 times the mass of Q. So if we think about the kinetic energy, again, of course, kinetic energy is going to be equal to a half mv squared. If we think about the kinetic energy of P, well, we're going to have something where, um, oh, sorry, the mass of P is 10 times bigger than the mass of Q. So if we think about, first of all, the kinetic energy of P, its mass is going to be equal to 10 times bigger than the value for Q, which would have a value of 1. But because the mass goes up by 10, for object P, its acceleration is going to go down by a factor of 10, and also its velocity is going to go down by a factor of 10. So if we think about the velocity of object P, um, it's going to be equal to 0.1 of what the, the velocity is of object Q. And because we've got something squared, we're going to be looking at 10 times 0.1 times 0.1, whereas here we've got 1 times 1 times 1. So that's the mass of P, 10 times bigger, but the velocity of P is 10 times smaller, and I've got it again because we squared that. So effectively what we're saying is that the ratio of P to Q is 10 times 0.1 times 0.1, which is 0.1, divided by 1. So that means the ratio of the kinetic energy of P to the kinetic energy of Q is going to be equal to 0.1 of what it initially was, which is A. Okay, hopefully that kind of makes sense. What I'm saying is that if you've got a bigger object, it's got more mass, but its velocity is going to be 10 times smaller. Okay, for 28, we had um, a graph where we want to see how the power depends with current for a component that obeys Ohm's law. And for something that obeys Ohm's law, it's going to have a constant resistance. 
And what we can say is that P is equal to I squared R. Now, if the resistance is constant, we can see that P is proportional to I squared. So when you've got a bigger current, we're going to have a bigger power. And that means we immediately get rid of B and D. And because we've got this squared term, it can't be this directly proportional relationship. And that means the answer has to be A. Now, you have to recall the ways to convert from electron volts to joules and joules to kilowatt hours. So one kilowatt hour is equal to 1,000 watts times 3,600 seconds. And that's then equal to 3.6 or 3 million uh, 600,000. So that's 3.6 times 10 to the 6 joules. Now, you've also got to be able to convert from joules to electron volts. And what we can say is that one electron volt is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So we've got electron volts in joules and joules in kilowatt hours. And all we need to do then is divide 3,600,000 by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And that gives an answer of 2.25 times 10 to the 25. OK, so looking at the answers there, the only one it can be is 2.3 times 10 to the 25. So you've probably done this conversion before, you've done this conversion before, and all we're doing is joining the two things up together. So D was the answer to question 29. So in this question here, we've got a component P, and we want to know the value of the resistance at this point. Now, this is a VI graph. Normally, we look at IV graphs. But I've just got to say that it is not the gradient. The gradient has got nothing to do with the resistance. OK, if you want to work out the resistance, what you need to do is you need to find a value of I, which is labelled as I2, and the value of V, which is labelled as V2. Now, R is going to be equal to V over I, and here it's going to be equal to V2 divided by I2. So that's why the answer is C, and it has got nothing to do with the gradient that they've drawn or the tangent that they've drawn on this graph. So that's number 30. So for 31, we have a thermistor, and we want to find out what happens to the current in each ammeter when the temperature decreases. Now, if you've got a thermistor, uh, we've got the resistance up here and temperature up here, we get something like this. So that means as the temperature decreases, the resistance is going to increase. And if you've now got a higher resistance here, that means less current is going to be moving through it. So the reading on A1 must decrease which means that we have to get rid of the answers for C and D, which say it's increasing. So the answer must be A or B. Now, the same potential difference is going to be acting across resistor A2. Um, so it doesn't give us the value, but the resistance is going to stay the same. The potential difference across it is the same because we've got a parallel circuit, and that means the current here must stay the same. So the value in A2 remains unchanged. It doesn't increase, and that's why A must be the answer for question 31. So for question 32, we have a circuit where we have cells in parallel. And we want to know what is the voltage across this, uh, this voltmeter and the, uh, the current in the ammeter. Now, first of all, um, the, volt, the potential difference here is going to be the potential difference across this resistor. And if we think about any loop in this circuit, then the EMF is going to be equal to the PD. So here the EMF is going to be 3, and that means the PD is going to be 3 as well. So for the first one, the voltage reading here is going to be 3 volts, so it can't be C or D. What about the current? Well, current is equal to the potential difference divided by the resistance, and we're going to look at the potential difference across it, which we already worked out in the first one was 3.0, and it's got a resistance of 12. So 3 over 12 is just a quarter, so that means the answer must be A. For number 33, we want to look at what's an equivalent unit to the ohm. So I'm going to say that resistance is equal to V over I, and what you might recall is that V is equal to E over Q. So we can also write the units for volts as the energy per unit charge, which is going to be joules per coulomb. When it comes to I, we can also say that I is equal to Q over T, so the charge transferred per unit time, and that's going to be the charge transferred C per second, so S to the minus 1. So when we write R is V over I, we've got V over I, 
and that means we can also say that r is equal to dual coulomb to the minus 1 divided by coulomb second to the minus 1. Now, we've got joules to the minus 1 divided by... Sorry, we've got joules on the top. You've got coulomb to the minus 1 divided by coulombs is coulomb to the minus 2. And then we've got something... Sorry, that should be a 1 there. Divided by s to the minus 1, which just becomes seconds. So an ohm can also be a joule coulomb to the minus 2 second. And that's why the answer for this is part B. And finally, question 34. It feels like this exam paper has gone on forever. I think I've got a little bit of uh, blue ink left in this pen, so let's have a look at this one. So we've got a 1.5 volt cell, we've got a voltmeter in series with this resistor, and we've got a couple of resistors down here. So what are the readings on the voltmeter and ammeter going to be? Now normally, a voltmeter has a really high resistance. In actual fact, the resistance is almost infinite. Um, and the reason for that is that we don't want any current flowing. Now, if that's got an infinite resistance or a very, very high resistance, then this resistance is just going to add on to that. And actually, that means there's going to be no current in this part of the circuit. So effectively, this resistor is a bit like a resistor inside that voltmeter. So what that means then is that if there's 1.5 volts there, then this voltmeter is also going to read 1.5 volts because it's effectively just measuring the potential difference across the cell or the potential difference across these resistors. So the value for the potential difference is going to be equal to 1.5, which means that it can't be answer A, or it can't be answer C. So what's the current going to be? Well, because there's going to be no current here, because that's such a high resistance, we can basically say that the current flowing is going to be equal to the potential difference, which is 1.5, divided by the total resistance of that circuit. And here the total resistance of this bit of the circuit here is going to be equal to 20 ohms. We've got 1.50 volts up there, and then 1.5 divided by 20 is equal to 0 0.075. So we've got a current of 0 0.075, which is flowing here, because effectively there's going to be no current in this part of the circuit. So the value for I is 0 0.075. And that's why the answer must be B for question 34. So, a long paper, but that was paper two from AQA in 2018. Again, um, hopefully that helps you, especially the multiple choice, where if you look at the mark scheme, it doesn't tell you actually how to answer the questions. So I hope that's been helpful, and if you haven't already done so, don't forget to subscribe to me to stay updated with all the other stuff I'm doing to help you with your A-level physics. Thank you very much, and good luck.